Thank you very much. It's really an honor to give this course, obviously. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. I hope, well, I'm sure I'll disappoint you. I'll do my best to minimize the damage. Uh, so, okay, so one could say that this whole idea of singular support is technical. So it emerges from a rather fine point on homological algebra. So, and let me tell you the, well, the source, the origin. So there are s these things called spectral sequences and we used to them converging and, but sometimes they diverge. So the spectral sequence doesn't compute what you want it to compute. And so this whole idea of single support is a measure to which a spectral sequence does not converge. And you may think, well, the spectral sequence doesn't converge, who cares, it's boring. But in fact, some mathematics does emerge from there. And I should say that it's not the first time. So the exact framework that I'll be dis discussing has appeared before. So one is, I'll mention it not in a temporal succession. One is um, what's called matrix factorizations. These things were discovered by physicists. So these people are smart guys. And another context was much, much earlier. So this is Tate cohomology. So the, they were also smart guys. Um, and so, but it's, it's the same idea of, that we'll be uh, dealing with today. So, as I said, we'll be measuring the divergence of spectral sequence and it's a kind of functional analysis. So we'll be doing functional analysis within category theory. So now, as to the framework of these lectures, today, well, let me say a sort of introduction. So, Gelfand used to say that if you write a paper, the introduction must contain it all. So, like, you must say everything you want to say in the introduction, and then there are a few technical details less left for the remaining 100 pages of your paper. So I'll basically try to say it all in one today, and I don't, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> okay, so let me begin. So, uh, well, ah, see, I already screwed up. No, I don't know how to lift it. Ah. Ah, this needs to go. Yes. It's not by physicists. Say again? It's fixation and it's not by physicists. First by incognitive algebra and then by means of Yes. 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 So, um, yeah, so all of this is joint work with Dima Rinkin. Um, so for us, the motivation came from geometric Planck So let me begin from there. So X is a curve, a smooth complete over a ground field K. So K will be algebraically closed, characteristic zero. This is because mainly just because I'm a coward, I'm afraid of characteristic P. Um, and G is a reductive group. So geometric Langlands begin, begins as follows. You consider bund G. This is the moduli space of principal G bundles on a curve. And you consider the category of D modules on that. It's a derived category. Well, when you talk about geometric Langlands, 90% of the time you talk about this, but in this course we won't. So it, it'll appear as a motivation. So I won't sp spend much time talking about D modules and what the, this derived category means. So on the other side, you have the stack of local systems on your curve with respect to G check. And this will be of interest for us, and I'll actually spend some time on it define it more precisely in my next lecture. And so we consider the derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves on that. And, so, and the naive form of 
geometric Langlands says that there must be an equivalence. And so this naive form takes place as is when g is commutative, i.e. when it's a torus. So that it's given by the fourier mukai lemont transform. And it fails when g is non-commutative. And this is the failure is exactly, well, our interest in this, in this course. So when you state geometric Langlands, of course, you don't want just to throw it like this. You want to specify what properties this equivalence has. As usual, well, we're doing Langlands, the most interesting part is the cuspidal part here and the irreducible part here. But again, for us, this doesn't, it happens not to be the, of central interest for these, for, for these lectures, because, well, as you know from the theory of automorphic functions, cuspidal functions present no, well, they're mysterious, but they present no analytical difficulties. They have rapid decay, and analytically they're fine. And as I said, we'll be dealing with functional analysis. So it's the Eisenstein series that cause you analytical troubles, and that's our interest. So again, we'll be doing functional analysis in, in algebraic geometry. So I will now state the property that this uh, equivalence is supposed to have with respect to Eisenstein series. And, that's, and, and from there, we'll see where the trouble is. So, so here is this property. It's compatibility of Langlands with Eisenstein. So let P be a parabolic. So it sits inside G and it projects onto its levy. And we have the corresponding uh, parabolic inside the Langlands dual. And so we have the corresponding diagram of moduli spaces. So in here, so let me call this map P and Q, and this I call P spectral, because we call this spectral side and Q spectral. Well, corresponding to these diagrams, we define functors, let's say going in one direction, from the levy to G. So here it's the Eisenstein functor. So we pull back by means of this map Q and push forward by means of P. And here we, I call it spectral Eisenstein, we pull back, well, do the same thing. So, if you all, all were gubbers, you would ask why this is defined. Because we're dealing with non-holonomic demodules, so this functor is not defined in general. It's a left adjoint, it might, might or might not be defined. It happens to be defined on the essential image here of this. So, again, I'm just saying this for honesty. Not that it's... What are you applying this to? Exactly. I'm applying it to non-holonomic demodules, but ones, so not to all guys here, but ones that, ones that come back by means of this, come as pullbacks by means of this map, and you can show that to these guys, the left adjoint is defined on them. This is the left adjoint of... Uh, by a P upper shriek. P upper shriek is always defined on all demodules, but P lower shriek may not be defined. And uh, no, your notation is a P upper star. <laughs> we have we had your lectures of Koshiwara and Shapira, I don't know. My notations are standard. Uh, it's, it's like I'm using the, the most standard notation. P upper shriek is the functor, it's the pullback for D modules that's always defined. Yeah, and, the, and Q upper star is the... I don't... Uh, Q, okay, Q upper star. Okay, you're right. So Q upper star, you may ask, why is it defined? It's this... In the D module world, it's not always defined, but this morphism Q is smooth, so it is defined. Mm -hmm. ah. Uh, anyway, another question, because if you, have, if you take a levy, uh, if you uh, lift the levy inside G, yes. there is another functoriality right. coming from the fact that M check is contained in G check. Correct. And so you have a Langlands functoriality which is uh, well defined. So there is a, yes, there is a map, there is another functor here, and you can also describe what happens here. 
But Langlands functality for P check, what does it mean exactly? Because classically, uh, I don't know. What no, no, so but uh, I'm not doing for P check. I'm, I'm going from here to here. I'm not even trying to go from P check. Yes, but on the other side, you have uh, the, the lock system. Maybe, yeah? On the right hand side. Yeah, it's, it's, so I go from here, pull back, push forward. So, so the point is, you, when you do the uh, automorphic induction, yeah. you have uh, a representation which is usually not irreducible. Correct. And you have a quotient and a sub-object. And so you have to choose which one you... I mean, because between the Steinberg and the trivial for GL2, you have to decide which one you want. Correct. In terms of functionality. So, so here you are thinking in terms of taking the whole induced representation. Okay. Well, so what you what you're what you're referring to is the local theory, and here's yeah. the locally or globally. You have also globally the, when you you look at the discrete spectrum for for example for GLN, uh, you have uh, the trivial representation is a quotient. And, Yes, but you see, uh, correct, but I'm not trying to decompose automorphic representations into sub-representations. Um, so it's not even representation, think about functions. I start with a kind of function on this induced space and I consider the function. So I'm, I'm not even interested here at the, at the questions of breaking it up into... So considering the D-check, I know the, the dual for root data, but I don't know how to do it for for groups intrinsically, if I choose a splitting, and, I mean, what is the... What's P-check? No, G-check. Yes. G-check, so I know if I choose a maximum torus and the, So, I know after isomorphism, but it's not sufficient. Oh, here I'm in trouble. Choose. <laughs> choose. <laughs> choose the pinning. Okay, so I choose the pinning of everything, and then everything is defined with split. Yes, let's, let's, let's do that for safety. Otherwise... Yeah. Okay, so we're more than one governing the audience, which is great. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll talk about it a lot. So if the morphism So there is a theory of upper shriek for, co for quasi coherent sheaf, this kind of extraordinary direct image. And it's well behaved for morphisms of finite or dimensions, such as this one. Yeah, this, it's upper shriek that, you know, upper shriek from the point produces the dualizing. It's this kind of upper shriek. And again, we'll return to this point. But I, I so far, I'm really glad people are paying attention. They're not just taking symbols symbolically. And P spec is uh, is uh, are you working on coherent or quasi coherent? That's exactly my point. So so far the conjecture is falsely stated. I work it's it's the quasi coherent category. Okay, and P spec is not proper. So it is pr it's proper. Ah, it is proper. P spec is proper. This guy is not proper, but this guy is proper. Ah, so this actually preserves coherence. It preserves coherence, but you're jumping ahead. We'll we'll get there in five minutes. It preserves coherence, but it doesn't preserve something else which is crucial for us. And boundedness, of course, in the effect of the it, Yeah, it, it preserves bounded coherence, but that's not enough for what I'll say in soon. Give me five minutes. Okay. Okay, so the promised compatibility is the following. So let's write the same diagram for the levy. So here we have this Eisenstein functor, and here we have this spectral Eisenstein functor, and we want this diagram to commute. So this is the compatibility of Langlands with between the group and its Levy subgroups. So what I'll do now, I'll explain why this thing cannot hold. Just it, this is impossible. Claim I. And again. And this has to do with, as I said, divergence of spectral sequences. So let me throw you into the cold water, okay? So I'll, I'll start talking about the essence of the subject. So it'll, well, it's becoming technical. So first of all, what kind of categories do, are we working with? So as Offer asked, these are, well, 
When I write quasi-co, I mean the unbounded derived category, no finiteness conditions whatsoever. So definition, a triangulated category is said to be co-complete. if it contains all direct sums. Okay, so you don't have any size bound. Just exactly. I was expecting this question. So let me please ignore set theory. So. But it's enough to, to do countably generated things? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a little, let me not just even not, not, not even go there. Yes, kind of for all practical purposes, countable is the word. Okay, so now I give the following definition. So let C be a co-complete category. An object C is compact if home from C commutes with the direct sums. So let me give you a familiar example. Let's first do it not in the derived category, let's do it in the abelian category. So let's take, instead of C for a moment, we'll take a ring A and we consider the category of A modules. So this will be my notation for the unbounded derived category. I don't like to write D, but so when I mean the abelian category, I'll put a little heart. It's Lurie's notation, I didn't invent it. So when you say heart, it means uh, the heart of the T structure. So I'm deviating from this context. So let's ourselves ask ourselves the following question. When does an object M, I mean a usual A module, well, is an object such that home from M to something commute with direct sums. So oh, I'm now confused. A module half is the category of A modules or the derived category? So heart means the heart of the T-structure. So it's a billion category for a moment. So I'm deviating from this context. I want to ask the same question in the billion in the abelian category. So let me actually turn to Gabber. So what do you say? No, but you see there is a difference because for the right category it's more natural to find and present it. I know, but no, I'm asking I'm asking, very con I'm asking a very concrete question. When does this compute with direct sums? I think it's fine to generate. Okay, fine to generate it. So question, answer, if and only if, M is finitely generated. Good. Okay, but let me modify this question. Now I'll take indeed the unbounded derived category, but M will still be in the heart. But I now ask, so, when is M compact? When is compact. And indeed, if and only if it's a perfect complex, if it admits a finite resolution, finite projective resolution, whose terms are finitely generated projective modules. So, compact, question. So, and then, then it becomes silly, let me not even write in the heart, so when a, an object complex is compact, if and only if, uh, it's perfect. So, i.e., by definition, 
admits, well, equivalent to a finite complex of um, finitely generated projective modules. Okay, so now let's uh, specialize to the case when A is a finely generated K algebra. So we denote the S spec A. Pardon? Oh, commutative, yes. And so when I write quasi co of S, it by definition means what I denoted A mod, so unbounded derived category. So from here we see the, f the following. So well, let me call it a lemma. An object. is compact if and only if it satisfies the following two conditions. So two conditions. One is that f belongs to what I denote by co. So co means finite complex with coherent cohomologies. Again, it's something that more classical would be denoted by db co. I don't, again, I don't like to write d. So, finite complex of, with coherent cohomologies, and there is an extra condition, so that is that it has a finite tor dimension. So, for every point of S, so let's denote by k sub s the size skyscraper. we form this derived fiber has finitely many cohomologies. So, so more precise in societal dimension is usually with uh, of course, it here it follows it, but independent of the point, but okay. I mean, so yeah, but this this is enough kind of for these purposes. So um, we always so we denote these compact objects by perf. So perf of S sits inside co of S, and the inclusion is an equality if and only if S is smooth. We are over an algebraically closed field. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so now let me explain why, why this is trouble for this. So we have the following very basic lemma. Suppose you have a functor between co-complete categories. In fact, we have a pair of adjoint functors. So we'll have lots of functors in the upcoming lectures. I'll be using the topologist notation. The one on top is the left adjoint and one on the bottom is the right adjoint. That's the notation they use and I became convinced that it's actually um, a convenient notation. So let me... Pardon? It's called up and <laughs> So let me also introduce a piece of terminology.
a functor is called continuous if it commutes with arbitrary direct sums, if it takes direct sums to direct sums. Yes, I mean, when I talk about functors between triangulated categories, I mean what are usually called exact functors, sent exact triangles to exact triangles. I'm not referring to any kind of T structure. Takes direct sums to direct sums. So I want to just add a word of warning it's that it's not guaranteed. Not every functor takes direct sums to direct sums. Namely, if you take some kind of infinite product, that would fail to take direct sums to direct sums. Okay, and here comes the little lemma. Let me... So this is stuck. Yeah, so well, let me see. I'll use it once and then I'll... Get it. So lemma is the following. Is it acceptable to give exercises to the audience in these lectures? Let me do it. So, a left adjoint is always continuous. So, if your functor appears as left adjoint, it automatically tells, takes direct sums to direct sums. So, it's, l it's an exercise. And B, if G is continuous, then F takes compacts to compacts. Okay, so now I'll explain why this is trouble. So the claim is that this Eisenstein functor on the automorphic side is actually a left adjoint. So is the left adjoint to another functor that I call constant term. And well, you just go the other way on this diagram. So you pull back with respect to upper shriek, and that's a functor that's always defined on D modules, and you push forward by means of the star with respect to Q. So hence, I's takes compacts to compacts. But now let's look at What's happening on the dual side? So what well, is, this, why is this case continuous? Is it continuous? Uh, yes. So these standard functors on the category of D modules, they're by construction continuous. They're tensor products. Yeah, they're essentially tensor products of something. And what is CT staring for? Constant term. It's, I'm just mimicking the definition of, at the level of automorphic functions. So, well, I discussed compactness for affine schemes. Uh, we will return in more, much more detail for in the case of algebraic stacks, uh, such as log cis. So believe me for now that things work in the same way, so that um, compacts are perfect. So the claim is that the functor I spec. So first of all, as Gabi remarked, it does send coherence to coherence.
so there is no trouble with that. And the reason it preserves coherence is because the morphism um, P spec is proper. So this is okay, but it does not send perf to perf. By the way, those are, those are stacks, yes? Those are stacks and we'll return. I'll, I'll, stacks, so pardon? There are art in stacks. So you, you have to stacks. use this, the, this log. The int the int int stacks, the, 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 the int. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to this point in a moment. Just let me just. Uh, yeah. So you use the which kind of, of topology? You use the smooth. Uh, to define this? I'll, re I'll, I'll return to that. I'll return to that. So these categories can be defined using any kind of topology. You can use smooth coverings or flat coverings. You'll, you'll always get the same. We'll, we'll get there uh, in the next lecture. So to answer Maxim's question, no, loxis is actually not in. It's, it says quasi-compact. Because if you become very unstable, you won't admit any connection. And the reason for this is that this morphism fails to be a finite or dimension. So it's easy to write an example for P1 that this morphism immediately produces for you, for you objects. You start with structure sheaf and you get something which is not perfect. And that finishes the story. So, so this cannot hold as stated. And so my goal over this lecture and the next, I'll correct the right-hand side to make the conjecture, well, at least not self-contradictory. But there was a point of view on coherent ships is perfect on something else, yeah, like loons and Kipino. Can, can you say again? No, this point of view on coherent ships is perfect on something else. Yeah. Exactly, and so that's where we're going. But you can also correct the other side for have, uh, to have a coherent? Uh, one can, yes. It's more difficult to work with because, you see, we'll correct it by some kind of phantoms. And these phantoms on the coherent side are, more, are easier to work with than these phantoms on the demodal side. But you can. Okay. So now comes the next piece of bad news, is that you can't stay with an algebraic geometry. If you want to do any of this, you have to go to derived algebraic geometry. So, and um, there are two ways to learn derived algebraic geometry. So either you take um, Lurie's books or Mm, or Bertrand and Gabriele and you read them all, spend three years, pass an exam, and in the end you'll still not know it. Yeah, so the only way to learn it, I think, is just to just believe in its existence and start using it. <laughs> Are you doing it just for Simplicial uh, things uh, defining the structures, see for so, more general stuff. What kind of see, if, if it was the day of judgment and you were God, you would ask me, what do you mean by derived algebraic geometry? I would say, I don't know and I don't care. I just, I just use it. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. No, no, I got the impression that there is a part of the language of right geometry which, is, which goes much old, to a much older thing, like in the museum, still is there simplicial rings and one can do put out yes. the So one can do some things with structure sheet replaced with simplicial things. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what people, because I didn't, I didn't read those things that you mentioned exactly, but <laughs> I, I, I just asked whether it is in the context of yes. simplicial. So be, because we are algebraic, well, because when creation is zero, you can, it's enough to do commutative DG, CDGAs. So because of this, it's enough to stay there. 
and the other things just uh, like simplicity just on one side or on two sides? One side. So that's, I will explain that in a moment. So let me say like this, I, well, I still make a lot of mistakes in d derived algebraic geometry and in higher category theory, lots. 99% of these mistakes happen to be at the level of usual categories. I make, I state a, a false lemma in this for higher categories and this happens to be false for ordinary categories. S somehow it's, somehow if you know the c usual category theory, you end up making correct statements about higher categories. That's, that's my experience. Okay, so what do I mean by derived algebraic geometry? So in ordinary algebraic geometry, you know if you have a commutative ring A, you can attach to it spec A, some kind of topological space with a sheaf of functions. So what you have to know about derived algebraic geometry is the same thing. But A is now, a, what do you call it, CDGA, uh, a commutative DG algebra which lives in non-positive cohomological degrees. The latter is important. That it starts from zero and goes to the left. So, so you can ask what is the topological space? So, of spec A is exactly the same as the topological space of its zeroth, i.e. top cohomology. So the, and it's exactly the, it's like scheme versus varieties. The nilpotents don't matter for your topological space and you really should think of this A as some enhanced nilpotents. Maybe you can it's like in the army or this uh, CDGA. You cannot uh, write it. <laughs> yes, I. Yeah. Yes, it's absolutely. So. Wait, wait. How do you know? Have you been? <laughs> see, I see. I have. No, I mean, no, no, no. How do you know? How do you know it's in the army? Because in the army they use. But how do you know that? I made them in military service. I see. You see, the reason I evaded mine is because I actually, it's true to I just saw these abbreviations. I, I said to myself, I can't handle it. And commutative <laughs> abbreviations. G com differential graded algebra. Maybe say not positively graded. <laughs> yes. You said a lot of things. <laughs> non positively graded. So sits in degrees zero and below. Ah, zero and below. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So so the topological space is the same as of its top cohomology and you really should think of this A as some version of nilpotence. So, you would, so we are used to having algebras with nilpotence. These elements of this algebra do not, well, they give rise to functions, but these functions may be non-zero element of the algebra, but the function may be zero if it's nilpotent element. So the same thing you should think of this A. It's kind of, kind of a richer fluff of nilpotence. Okay, so here are, mm. so in order to do algebraic geometry, you really need one thing, you need to be able to localize. So in ordinary algebraic geometry, if you have an element f in A reduced, so killed in nilpotence, in this case, you will be able to localize f. Localize A, localize A with respect to F. So you localize not really with respect to elements in A itself, but actually with respect to elements in the corresponding reduced ring. And the same happens here. If F is an element in H0, and even take reduced of that, you will be able to con um, con produce a new algebra, a new CDGA. 
And so you have the risky localization, and out of that you build, you build your algebraic geometry. Um, but instead of uh, morphism of ring spaces, you will have to introduce some quasi-isomorphisms. Yes, so I'll say, I'll, say the, I'll, I'll say something about this. So, say you have two derived schemes. So, derived schemes form a category. They do. So, you have S1 and S2, you can form the set. So, and it's fine, however, this may lead you to a dangerous place. So, let me say what else you have and why you want to consider that something else. So, what you really have is What you really have is the homotopy type of maps S1 to S2 such that this home set is pi naught of this homotopy type. So these derived schemes, they form what's called the higher category. So in which sense of higher category? Exactly. I don't know. No, but <laughs> when you want to actually do it, uh, do you have a, a rigorous way to...? Yes, I mean, so what I do, I have, say, I have Luri's book on my desk, I put my left hand on, on, on the book and I type with my right hand. And that's the best I can do. Or just believe in the existence of higher categories. Oh, there is a way of using certain kind of simplicians. Yeah, that's what Lurie does. And other people use other, other approaches, and then you can look at the internet, you can find all kinds of references. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I kind of, I, an honest answer, I don't know, I don't care. So I believe that there exists one, I believe that there exists one, just one theory of infinity categories. But there are people who write better on comparing certain. Yes, let them do it. So, if you want, okay, so let's say I use Lurie's model okay. for now, for, for me. I, I use that, but, but honestly, I don't even use it. <laughs> All right, so let me say a word why you want to consider this space instead of this, instead of this the set. So here is a typical way, and so maybe if you've never seen higher, never worked with higher categories, maybe this is the point of entry. So kind of what I explain now gives you motivation why you want to think about higher categories. So, um, let's, do fi let's do fiber products. So, say I have, let's say even affine derived schemes. So, and I want to form this. So, this is, let's say this is spec A1, this is spec A2, this is spec A3. So, on the one hand, I know what I want to get. This is going to be... Uh, spec of A1 derived tensor product A2, A3. But, I mean, as, well, Groth and Dick taught us, it's not good to just def give definitions by explicit formulas. You, when you define an object, you want to say what functor it represents. So in ordinary algebraic geometry, we know that HOM from T To map to the fiber product is to well, is to map like this. So this is what happens in ordinary algebraic geometry. Now this is false in derived algebraic geometry. What is true 
And this is kind of, well, this is when I said, like, it's easy to accust, to get yourself used to thinking in higher categories. Never write this. Write this. And this is true. It's fiber product of homotopy types. Well, now, you can take pi naught of both sides by pi naught of homotopy types does not commute uh, with, with this. Of course, you need not just a homotopy type, but actually. Well, it's, it's, we need something. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, it's fiber product homotopy types. Fi it's a fiber product in the category of spaces. Homotopy fiber product. Homotopy fiber product. So. And the derived tensor product is by using a flat replacement of one factor or something like this. Or? Yeah, and again, so I know how to compute it. I don't. But the lift of the tensor product, if you consider it as a CDGA, it's unique up to some equivalence or something. Exactly. So, I mean, this contractible space of choices, I mean, this higher category theory produces such things. So, and if you're a practitioner, you'll, you won't ever bother about, I mean, when you compute the right product, product, you will not really find the flat resolution. You, all you care about how this thing looks like and you exactly know how to compute it. Okay, so this is the setup for derived algebraic geometry. So let me, let me give you one example of what it buys you. Well, one can imagine the whole kind of compatibilities in doing this where you have to check that some guy from yes. the youth is usual. Yes. And even in usual algebraic geometry, we have spectral sequence and such things a problem. And when you're doing this without knowing the exact definitions, how can... And that's what I said. It turns out that you, one is very unlikely to, miss, to, 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 to make mistakes in that. If you just buy yourself into the ideology of infinity categories, you, kind of knowing how the theory is set up is really unhelpful. And can you do all the science also in this? Theory? Science? Yes, I should see <laughs> you can tell the category of super reference spaces. <laughs> All right, so let me give an example. So, for the future, let me say that so S spec A is, well, here's a kind of, homo, kind of derived algebraic geometry word, almost of finite type if. Gabriel, it's your, where is he? It's your definition, right? Almost, I think. So, if, so H0 over K is a finite type in the usual sense. And all the other HIs are finitely generated as modules over H naught. So this is kind of the derived algebraic geometry analog of being finite type. That's where things... So it's going to make kind of resolution finite to major degree, but maybe it's a Yeah. So without almost, it means that actually it's actually finite. But Okay, so in this case, you can define the tangent complex so if it's not finite type, you have to talk about cotangent complex. By the way, quasi-co has the same meaning. It's A modules. So, well, Illusi, of course, has a definition. But let me give this definition like this in the world of derived algebraic geometry. So rather, I'll define uh, the tangent fibers. So let me take a point of S. Oops. 
What do you mean by a point? The point of the actual scheme? The yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a map from spec k to this thing, i.e. it's a map from a to k. When you map a to k, you automatically kill all the lower cohomologies. A point is a point on the underlying classical. Let me say, OK. So for S, you can attach classical, namely, if S is spec A, this is spec H naught of A. Classical is just complete, uh, completely analogous to passing to the reduced, but you're not killing all the nilpotents, I'm killing all the lower cohomologies. As a point of a scheme is the same as the point of the, of the underlying variety, the same thing the point of a derived scheme is the, is the point of an underlying classical scheme. But, but you say that the, the topological space is... Uh, you define it as a topological space first and you did not say that there is another space. So a yeah, point a cannot scheme, be yeah, something yeah, else. Yeah, <laughs> can, can you say, can you say no, but it's even written on the blackboard. Topological, yes. Yeah, so th there were, it was unambiguous from the beginning. The rest is not even a set. So. <laughs> right. But I'm saying that if you think of points as maps from spec, spec K to A, you recover the same thing, namely just... You recover the closed points. Um, K, K points. Okay. So I want to define the tangent space. Well, the tangents derive tangent space, so it'll be a complex. So, by the way, my notation for the category of chain complexes of vector spaces is vect. If I write a heart, I, means, I mean just vector spaces, as usual. When I write less than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to zero, I mean complexes situated lower degree, degrees below zero and above zero. So, the tangent is a complex that is above zero. So, H0 of that is the tangent space of the, of the underlying classical as we know it. Who knows how to define the tangent space of a scheme at a point? Maximal of the square. The dual. Dual of that, but I want functorially. Uh, X. I thought, uh, of the yes. So it's home from spec epsilon k to your s such that well the closed point is set is sent to your point does anybody have an Idea how In general, if you send a classical uh, scheme to a derived scheme, the arm is something special or not? So, in that direction, home from a classical to derived is the same thing as a form home from a classical to the underlying classical. The same thing as a map from a variety to a scheme is the map to the underlying variety. Same. This is for the pi zero notion of No, no, no. So, that's home from classical to derived is discrete in that direction. Ah, there is no higher homotopy. Yeah, so, yeah, home from classical to derived, this map space is actually discrete. So, who has an idea of what that is supposed to be? Pardon? Go for it. Epsilon should epsilon by pi. Exactly. But now, change the meaning of epsilon, so it will be now a CDGA, where the degree of epsilon is negative i. And that recovers. So, like, Illusi's tangent vectors have a geometric meaning. It's also maps from a version of dual numbers, but alter the degree. And now it is pi zero or what is it? Home. I wrote home. Which is, which is pi zero of maps, see? And of course you can recover the entire thing. So let me add, give another exercise to the audience. Recover 
not the individual cohomologies, but the entire thing. Like, give me a formula that gives just the cotangent fiber as is. So. so if you really want to do the exercise, I'll be very happy to talk to you. All right. That's the dual of you know, this cotangent complex. Yeah, so. Without defining the cotangent complex, you want to recover it in this? So, in almost finite type, these two pieces of informations, for information are equivalent. So, I'm not losing any information. I would not do this thing in the infinite type. And it's, in general, it's better to do it. It's better to talk about the cotangent. The reason I talk about the tangent is because it has this immediate geometric interpretation. Okay. So, I'm proceeding in a pace kind of, well, significantly slower than I thought I would. And I'm really glad that I am because I, like, I really like that people are active. So, do you, we've, I, it's been going on for an hour. Shall we make a break? So do you think it's a good idea? Yeah, so let's make a break and then we'll... 10 minutes something? Yeah. As I said, we're interested in measuring the difference between perf and co. We'll return to these in the derived setting in a moment. I will not be able to really measure the difference in the general case, but there will be a specific class of derived scheme for schemes for which I'll be able to do it. These schemes are called quasi-smooth. So let me give the definition. So I'll first give the following lemma. So, so all my schemes from now on will be assumed locally, almost of finite type. So S is a smooth classical scheme classical I mean that only H0 exists HI below 0 are 0 if and only if its tangent fibers only exist in degree 0 So this is something you know for classical schemes. If you take a classical scheme, you know it's smooth if and only if uh, the tangent fibers are, take Illusi's cotangent complex, if you take fibers take du in dualized, then uh, you will only see zeroth cohomology. But it's also true in the derived setting with the same proof. So now comes the definition. S is quasi-smooth if these guys vanish for i greater than 2. So smooth difference from quasi-smooth, but in that you allow one extra cohomology. So this is a very convenient definition as a definition, let me reformulate it in maybe more comprehensible terms. So first of all, let me just say that this is equivalent to the following. So particularly equivalent to the following. If you take the cotangent complex of S. So then locally it can be written with a loc, so free. 
can be represented by length to complex consisting of free guys locally. Now let me. You are speaking now about your over the differential graded algebra. Yes. So, so have you? Uh, you didn't really discuss the kind of derived category for differential graded algebra. Okay. But you know what it is. Okay. okay. Uh, so because uh, there, there are three modules in different senses. No, free. No, free. Free. I mean. Just direct sum of se several copies of A itself, no shifts. Take c several copies of your ring A, put in degree negative one, take several copies of degree A, put in degree zero, have a map, take the cone, and that's what I want this to be. But you say free, is the free or free? Locally. Okay, but now let me give you geometric re reformulation. Uh, S now is not classical, it's uh, NA. No, yes, this is, this is derived. So, and here is a lemma which is parallel to this lemma. So, S is quasi-smooth if locally it can be written as a fiber product like this. When I write a n, the affine space, I really mean a n. It's a spectrum of the polynomial algebra, classical one. So a map between a n's, as we said, a map from classical to derived is the same as to underlying classical. This is really given by how many m polynomials and n variables. And this is a point. So like this side of this diagram is completely classical, but you form the fiber product in the derived setting. So you form, consider, derived map of rings. So quasi-smooth means that it's a derived lo so derived locally complete intersection. And do you have to pass to the risk operating with the fine spaces or the local models are for the full of fine spaces? Why well, it doesn't matter because this are easy. I don't I, I don't remember. That it, it's, but it, in any case it doesn't matter. So I think I just don't let me not even think of it. So um, let me actually prove this thing in one direction. It's because we'll use it a bunch of times. Suppose you have, in general, suppose you have a fiber product like this, call this map F, for y1 and y2 anything. So let me write the tangent sheaf of S Tangent shift is the dual of the cotangent. Let me just say what it is. So it's going to be the following. You take, well, it's, it is what it is, what it's supposed to be. So you're, you're taking um, tangent shift of y1, kind of restricted to s, and the differential of f, this is df, maps to the tangent shift of y2 restricted to s, and you take, well, kernel of the derived algebraic geometry, co-cone, or topologists like to call it fiber. So, in this setting, you will see that the tangent sheaf of S is, so, the tangent sheaf of AN is just the free module of rank N, so you'll see it will be OS power N mapping to OS power M fiber of that. So it's explicitly a complex of length 2 put in degrees 
0 and 1. So this was cotangent, this is degrees negative 1 and 0, so dualized. So if you wish, this is the proof in one direction, and the proof in the opposite direction is pretty much the same as this. So, who remembers the definition of locally complete intersection in classical algebraic geometry? No, a scheme. I give you a classical scheme. When, when is it a locally complete intersection? So, a uh, locally intersection scheme or scheme of. No, find a, find a type over K. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. So. Cotangent complex is completely minus zero. That's true, but okay, but differently? <laughs> okay, different equation. Look at it. So, so it's locally locally it's a close sum scheme of something smooth defined by a regular sequence in mm -hmm. one of the equivalent senses of a regular sequence. But Yes, or maybe number of equations is equal to the co-dimensional. Yes, or you can say it like this. So let's note that classical classical LCI is equivalent to the following. It's a quasi-smooth plus classical. So if you take a classical scheme regarded as a derived scheme, so it just ha doesn't happen to have lower cohomologies, it's LCI if and only if it's quasi-smooth. And so that partly explains why LCIs are so nice. So basically, kind of classical schemes that arise are either smooth or they obtained from smooth schemes by you're taking the fiber of such some map. So when you're taking the fiber of such some map, so what's a fiber? It's a fiber product. And when you're doing it in the classical setting, well, you can think of it as follows. You're taking the derived setting and then you're throwing away the lower cohomologies. So you're doing something horrible. Um, so LCIs are those classical schemes that, I mean, you didn't, you didn't do anything horrible to them. There's also the question, it's bounded, bounded uh, cotangent complex. Yes. Equivalent so to uh, LCI, is it true or not? Uh, I'm forgetting, it's, it was Quillen's conjecture? It's yes. a kind of conjecture. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the status of this. But th is there something like that? In oh, no, no, no. So, in derived algebraic geometry, you can, uh, so, well, you can have a cotangent complex of any length. Any length. Yeah. So, well, this, well, that phenomenon is exactly kind of passing through the classical, you do, you're doing something very non-trivial from the homological point of view, truncating. Okay, so now, now we'll play another game, which is, we'll, we'll need it for our definitions, but it's, I think it's fun in any case. I find it fun. Ah, I'll, I'll play this game here. So, let's do this, take the tangent fiber and shift it cohomologically to the right by one. Do you know, do, well, who of you knows that this has a canonical structure of Lie algebra? Yes. Why do you know that? For my childhood, Who told you that? Invented. Ah, no. <laughs> you, you, you told that already, I mean, some, somewhere I, I held it. Quillen, right? It's, it's basically, it's, basically, it's, it's Quillen reality. Yeah, but in Quillen, in fact, the rest geometry was already in Quillen. But I, we, didn't, we didn't say the word Lee yet. So infinity algebra is the same Yes. So, okay, so let me correct. So Quillen tells us this, but let me give a different interpretation. Not, not different, same, but it's kind of, it's, it's very intuitive in the, in the... But uh, what is the point with T, star, T, S, it can be anything, and... Uh, so take any scheme S, at any derived scheme S, take any point. No, no, but it can be, it can be a vector space, or... Uh, oh, so far it's, it's just a complex of vector spaces? Yes, but any complex of vector spaces has a kind, this kind of interpretation? Oh, if I can realize it like in this, in this way? Is that the question? 
No, no, but you, what is specific to the fact that it, it is T of the tangent space? Uh, yeah, class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so maybe just I'm not answering the question. So I'm saying that if you take this particular complex of vector spaces shifted by one unit, it will have a canonical structure of Lie algebra. That's what I'm saying. But this is only only for this specific thing. So. Yes. Well, I mean, if you're asking, can they realize any any complex of vector spaces in this form? No, no, no. no, no, no. What do you mean canonical structure of Lie algebra? Really the algebra? Of complexes or DGLA. Another army word, differential graded Lie algebra, canonical object in the infinity category of differential graded Lie algebras. So I'll construct it. But you don't have to specify, Pardon? specify a point. I mean. Oh, I specify. The shift level by the Atia class. Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm doing it pointwise. So here is the construction. You have your point. Consider the fiber product point times point over my scheme S in the derived sense, but now, well, because it's a point, it's actually a group object in derived schemes. And it has a name. It's called inertia. So now, in derived algebraic geometry, if you have a, a group, you can take its Lie algebra. And if you look at this calculation, like of this, what happens under fiber squares, you'll see that the Lie algebra of inertia, its underlying, well, Lie algebra, well, it's a tangent space, it's a complex, so Lie algebra of this will be, will be this. So if you want to think of the Lie algebra structure, it's really the Lie algebra of Lie group, namely this one, the inertia. Again, and I'm, I'm not saying anything different from Quillen. I'm just re reinterpreting. And what did Quillen say originally? <coughs> Quillen's original definition? What was the result of defining whatever I, I So Quillen, he, it was almost an equivalence of categories between, let's say, commutative rings, commutative algebras and Lie algebras, contravariant something. But let's let's ignore that for a second. So th this is my definition. It sounds called Moore, not Killen. Okay. So uh, here is another f fun fact about this. So consider. Remember, we denote by K sub S the skyscraper. Let's consider our home. So I usually don't like. I don't write R. For derived, I'm just, if I were to write home, it will look a little weird. What I mean is derived endomorphisms of my skyscraper. So what structure does that have? It's an associative differential graded algebra. I'm, see, I'm sure you've seen this one in commutative algebra. Question, why do I mention this after this? But the arm is over what? Oh, <laughs> depending what you do. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Math from skyscraper to skyscraper. It's an associative DG algebra. I started talking about inertia, and then I skipped to this. Why? Because you do So this is Horshid cohology in your setting? No, it's not Horshid. I mean, I'm, I'm at a point. OK, so and now we are ready to define actually singular support. No, but behind there are some concrete uh, statements, uh, classical statements on the, on the Torah. Can you say again? Is there behind that? Uh, oh, there uh, yeah, maybe. No, no but there, is, there is a classical statement. Uh, no, it, in a sense. 
No, it is a classical statement. So you can, you know, you can take it's a differential. You can realize this by the differential graded Lie algebra. Take its universal enveloping in the very classical sense. Take take its cohomologies. It'll be just a graded associative algebra, mm -hmm. and it'll be the algebra of X. So it's a true statement. Yes. But it also is also true in this fancy language of that is, if you do everything in some derived sense, you will have some equivalence in suitable. You mean what do I mean by equal sign? Equal means equivalent. canonically equi canonically isomorphic in my world of again I have the infinity category of associative DJ algebras and it's a canonical isomorphism in that in that setting. So it means that you have models of both sides, some kind of zigzag diagram between them or something. Or as Maxim said, contractible set. Yes. Choices for yeah. But for example, uh, the algebra means a bracket, so we should see a bracket somewhere. You mean the Lie bracket here? Yeah. Yes, I mean so. No, but I mean in a, in a more naive way. I mean, there should be a, at least you take the cohomology group. I don't know. I mean, I so I mean, you, of course you can construct a. You, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So. We'll use the statement for one of the definitions of singular support. It's good for theoretical definition. So, like, it, in my experience, this is not a kind of object that you'll actually want to realize by explicit cochains. Some of them, some of the objects that we'll encounter, you want to write down explicitly, like you want to write down really a model for di differential graded Lie algebra. For some of them, you don't. In experimentally, exp empirically, this is not the kind of thing that you'll want to write down explicitly. At the end, you will, you, so if you go with later on your singular support, you will say a concrete statement on scheme, uh, and uh, we will not be able to understand. No, 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 you will. I mean, kind of, I'll, I'll make sure that things are computable. Singular support. No, no, but okay. Yeah. So this is good for a theoretical definition. And for actual computations, you do something else. So, I mean, in my next lecture, I'll give a bunch of different definitions. Some of them are good for proving things, and some of them are good for computing things. And so this is one, f which is this one is good for pro for defining things. All right. So. No, but an example will be good. I mean, S is the affine. <laughs> yeah, so I really want to get into an example. And I hope it's still realistic. So. I might not. OK, we'll see. I just I kind of. I, if I don't have time to do it now, I'll start from the, for an example next time. All right. Ah. Oh, where is it? Okay. So I now want to define um, singular support. So, so S is almost a finite type. And so let me say what I mean by co S. So these are objects in quasi co such that the individual cohomologies are finitely, finitely generated. over H0 of S and, and bounded, finitely many non-zero cohomologies for all but finitely many uh, 
Okay. So let's start so starting from this S, I'll define for you a subset somewhere. And that's what I'm going to do. We, we take an object and we take a point and we consider and that's acted on This thing acts by endomorphisms of the source, therefore it acts. In particular, so the DGLA, differential graded Lie algebra, In particular, let's just now let's pass to individual cohomologies. So if you take just graded graded Lie algebra acts on So now assume that S is quasi smooth. So then this differential graded algebra will have only two pieces. It will have a piece in degree one that corresponds to, well, H0 of the tangent space, and piece in degree two, well, we have the shift that corresponds to h1 of this. In particular, it'll have, in degree 2, it'll have this abelian Lie algebra, which is just h1. So, if you consider h1, yet yeah, note this shift, so that kind of placed in degree 2, it's abelian Lie algebra acts on this module. In other words, the symmetric algebra acts on this module. Symmetric algebra, but the generators are placed in degree two. And now you can take the support in the most naive sense, just support in the sense of commutative algebra. You have a graded mo module over a graded polynomial ring. So we define singular support at S of F to be the support. Okay, let me see if people are still awake. Uh, the support will be a subset of what? Which? Great. Yeah. C conical because things are graded. The support of this direct sum. as a module. Over sim.
By the way, what kind of module is it? Is it the finite? Happens to be finitely generated. That is a uh, uh, the x are zero for large i. No, 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 no. It's not. It's, it's just a finitely generated module. Over this algebra. I'll state th theorems to this effect next time. So when f is, is coherent, coherent in your sense, mm -hmm. oh, of course, you can make it the research, okay, I can... It's not difficult theorem, it's, but it requires proof. Yeah, of course, you need to do something. But when you say place in degree two... It maps from x to i to x... It acts from x to i to x to i plus two. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's all I meant. So it's a Zariski closed conical subset. Okay. Now we want to take all of those S's together. Where do they live? These guys. Use again this blackboard. So when you first come to the first course of differential geometry, and they define the tangent space to you, tangent bundle. How do they define it? For manifold. <laughs> no. They say the tangent bundle is the union over all points of a manifold of tangent vectors. You don't like it, huh? <laughs> okay. Sing of S is the union over points in S. Uh, it's been brutal. Okay. From this definition, not very clear why this is an algebra points of algebraic variety. <laughs> oh, that's okay. We'll write it's isomorphic to relative spec. It's a spec over S. Who's still awake? It is, it is inside something or? Pardon? Pardon? It's an honest. No, no, but uh, when you say union, it's inside something or it's uh, just. <laughs> no, uh, no, as, as, a co as a tangent bundle, like, you know, a tangent bundle of a manifold, it's a union, abstract union of points and tangent vectors, that's what I mean. It's like, no, not inside anything, it's like. <laughs> but it's <laughs> nowhere. Yeah. yeah, so this is a classical scheme. No, no derived games here. It's like, I will take H0, but. You know. For the moment, it's just a second. Yeah, so you take the tangent sheaf, sh shift it cohomologically by one, it lived in degrees zero and one, you shift it, take H zero of that, and it's no longer a vector bundle, it's a coherent sheaf. Take its sim over OS and take the relative spec. So now you are describing a it's classical, as classical, as classical, as classical, something classical. Well, it would be the same because I took H zero. It's so. Uh, you mean it has even a non-radio structure, mm -hmm. a scheme structure? Uh, really? For our purposes, we don't care because we will be only interested in support in that. No, but if you write that, it's a... Uh, okay, it's in some it, may have, it may have an importance. Yeah. So, I, as I wrote, it's a scheme. Yeah. I could have replaced it by the, re the reduced part, mm -hmm. for, for my purposes. All I care about is that its points are defined in this way. It's the same. Okay. And... Okay, I'll have to sacrifice some of this. So.
So finally, so definition for f coherent of s, the singular support of f, well, it's the union for s in s of this pointwise singular supports. So each of these fellows sits inside each of these fellows, so therefore it makes sense as a subset in sing of s. So a proposition that I'll explain, well, fiber-wise it's Zariski closed, as I wrote it's not obvious it's Zariski closed, but you have to, well, it's not difficult to prove. is possible to just get a group of kind of homogeneous with jam action on this coherent sheep on this guy and click on this support. No, that's not the so we'll get there to the fourth lecture. What you cannot get, you absolutely cannot get anything on this scheme. It will only have support along the, these guys. We'll talk about this in detail. So that is, that is impossible. So you really cannot produce anything that lives scheme theoretically here. Like with respect to the scheme, you only have something set theoretic. But it has multiplicity? Like, uh, so this is something I don't know. So we only know single support, we don't know anything about cycles. This question hasn't been investigated by us. It might have been investigated by other people. I just I have zero knowledge. And it might be interesting, so I just don't know. Okay, I'm ignorance, but I'm interested, so I just don't know. So to prove it's a risky clause, you need to do something, not just... Point-wise. Yeah, I have to generalize this, and we will do. I just wanted to give a definition of single support, which we, I gave. Yes. We'll so next lecture will be devoted to five different definitions. This will be one of them. But you can imagine, uh, for, for the support, uh, the characteristic variety, you have two definitions. You have definition with D module, and you have also definition uh, graded things, and you have also definition with vanishing cycle. The point is in the support, in the characteristic right. variety. Is there something like that? Yes. N well, not exactly vanishing cycles. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. No, no. So, yeah, we'll, we'll choose a function, and then something will happen along this function. Okay. Yeah, there is a definition like this, due to Dreamfield. All right. But, so let me state, kind of, So single support does indeed measure something. So in one direction it's very easy from here to here, but if it just happens that single support is zero, your thing was perfect. So single support does measure the degree of imperfection of your object. Just in the same way, if you look at the thing, this variety measures to what extent your S was not smooth. So as I stated this lemma, that, well, that lemma, you see, if these guys are all zero, then S was smooth. So this measures how much S is far from being smooth, and F, a singular support, measures how much F is far from being perfect. Okay. And so, so this has a meaning even if S is classical, and uh, it's hard to understand. <laughs> so it has, no, it has a meaning if F, it only makes sense for s smooth, sorry, for quasi-smooth schemes. So if S is locally complete in time, if it's an LCI, that it makes perfect sense. But otherwise, for just classical, the most basic example of LCI. <laughs> ah, but so the most basic example is coming up, and it's not. Yes, but it's not classical. That's the thing. 
The most basic example, I uh, will do it. I think well, so okay, we'll write <laughs> equal to zero, you mean empty or equal to the zero section? No, the zero section. <laughs> zero section. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 it contains a section. All right. Hmm. All right. So, uh, what do you say? If it is uh, f is zero, the singular support. Is, no. empty. What did you say? If f is zero, singular support is empty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this, uh, that's the way I should say it. So, so oh, let, let's check. <laughs> so if it's zero, if it is empty or not. <laughs> okay. So, so let. Okay. Now we're ready for an example. Uh, Ah, I still want to keep that. Okay. And the singular support is empty if and only if f is zero? Yes. Empty is zero. <laughs> so, So here is the most, the most basic example of a quasi-smooth scheme. It actually happens not to be classical, and it's the kind of scheme that's used all the time. So namely, you take point times point over a vector space, i.e. it's a spectrum, spec of sim of V star Okay, so let's so this is my this is my s okay so for, before we talk about the thing, what are the points of this thing? How many points does it have? use <laughs> classical points uh, we yeah, there's only one notion of point like. K points. How many? No. So what's the classical scheme underlying this one? Us. Ah, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah but so I'm first asking how many? What are the points of this guy? No. One point. One point. Okay. So. Okay. Now, what's the sing of this? What do you say? V or V star? <laughs> 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 okay, great. So now we'll kind of we'll analyze this example in detail. So I claim that Co of S has a very explicit description. These are so this is causal duality, and it's so causal duality usually breaks down because some finiteness conditions don't hold, but they exactly break down because of the difference between co and perf. So as written is exactly true. And this, this functor in one direction is given k, sorry, f goes to, well, our home from our unique point f. I should have said that this. What do you mean? Because it's a great what do you mean by right? Set functor geometry. Well, this is a. CDGA. Uh, I'm considering modules for this such that their cohomologies are finely generated over in the classical sense. 
No, but now V minus 2 is placed in degree plus 2. Plus two yeah. And this is not like the convention that you have originally for CDGA. Correct. So this is not a legit object of derived algebraic geometry, and I'm not regarding it as such. I'm not trying to take the spectrum of this. Okay, so, so now you are taking a, a finally generated module in the, in the derived category of this to consider guys which are... I'm do, so here, here's what I'm considering. I'm taking, in the derived category of these, I'm taking modules. If I take their cohomologies, they become, it's a graded module over the graded ring, and I want that to be finally generated. Ah, okay, so this is the analog of D finally generating this set of <coughs> Yes. It's the same as perfect modules. Yeah, so, or it's the same as perfect modules over this. So, by the way, inside here we have perf. Can somebody guess what that corresponds to? Yeah, it, that's, that's supported zero. So this is... And let me write kind of zero. Support cohomologies are supported as, as, at zero. So this means that the cohomology actually is five-dimensional. Yeah, ah, okay. Yeah. The direct, the, there are finitely many cohomologies which are finite. Yes, and so, well, basically, I'm just applying the definition, but gi this gives you a way to think of the singular support. So you start with an object here, you transfer it here. Look at the cohomologies. It's a graded module over sim v, you know, take its support. So like this causal duality, well, in this particular case, just exhibits you by definition, well. The graded is a, what is graded? Oh, it's a, it's a module over this differential graded algebra. I take its individual cohomologies. So, when you say the sim uh, mod, it's graded mod. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I always, that's my notation. I call it A, it's a differential graded algebra. When I write A mod, I mean co cohomologically graded. So this is, if you wish, well, in this case, this, this causal duality gives you single support explicitly. That's what it does. And it turns out that all the theorems you prove, at the end of the day, you reduce to this case. So this is the most basic uh, quasi-smooth scheme. This is the case where you, you take the point times the point of a smooth scheme, a classical smooth scheme. This is a y yes. Well, that example. Yeah, this cover. It's, it's the same because it's all locally. It's the same as a vector space. So kind of, if you want to have an example, you want to have this example. Mm. All right, maybe I'll end now. But there's a concrete description of those of perfect text. Perfect. Uh, I could say perfect. Could be algebra. Could say perfect models. Yeah, perfect is just you know whatever can be, uh, whatever can be constructed in f as finitely many operations on the free guy. Yeah, it's okay. So, that's, so that's that's a definition. Well, I mean... No, but on the other side. <laughs> so, oh. So these are the guys. Well, I can tell you what they are. They are actually finite dimensional. So it's supported zero means it's Artinian. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens to perfect. So under Kuzul it goes to Artinian. Um, but then you can say, and you take the support, that's the support. It measures how much non-Artinian you are. Okay, so I think I did maybe, let me see, I did two thirds of what I wanted to do, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah, not so bad. Well, okay.